The stories shared on It Takes Balls are unique to the individual sharing. Always speak with your trusted medical provider for treatment options specific to you. Welcome back to It Takes Pulse, presented by Testicular Cancer Awareness Foundation. Today, I'm joined by another doctor who's a friend of TCAF, Dr. Nick Cost. He's an um, associate professor of urology and oncology at University of Colorado Hospital and Children's Hospital of Colorado. Dr. Nick Cost, thank you for being here. Oh, it's my, uh, my pleasure. So we're going to be talking about a few different topics today, including fertility preservation, gonadal function impact of testicular cancer therapy, and testicular cancer sparing or testicular sparing surgery. But before we get into all that, I know that you had have your own personal bout with cancer history. If you want to talk about that, yeah, I appreciate that, Stephen. I, I um, when I meet with patients and um, you know, especially testis cancer patients, given the age, I uh, don't lead with this because I don't ever want to make this situation uh, when you're seeing someone in clinic about the doctor. Um, but usually towards the end of a visit, uh, when I first met them, I'll, I'll uh, bring up the fact that I can try to empathize with what they're going through. Um, when I was 26, I was diagnosed with melanoma and uh, was in my residency, neurology residency, and um, you know had had interest in oncology, had had interest in pediatric urology, but really you know, wasn't exactly sure where I was going with my career, I would say. Um, having that experience, the diagnosis, the treatment, the outstanding care that I received uh, from the surgeons and uh, dermatologists and so forth. It really was um, very impactful. And I felt like this experience as a adolescent young adult with cancer was a unique experience. And I wanted to be involved in, in helping in some way, I don't know, as a way to pay it back or pay it forward, however you look at that. And um, you know, then it became very clear that uh, testis cancer is, is a great example of that. I mean, it is the most common AYA or um, adolescent young adult uh, malignancy in, uh, that, that we deal with in any scenario. And so as a urologist, I was well uh, set up to, to focus in that area. And so, you know, I had interest in taking care of young patients with cancer. And so did uh, an oncology fellowship and then a pediatric urology fellowship. And so now I straddle those two worlds and testis cancer is one of those diagnoses that really bring those two together. And I bring that up to patients because I, I tell them, you know, it's not just that you're another patient in the line of ones that I have to see today or help take care of, but it's really personal. And um, I provide my contact information to patients and I stress that I think when you're taking care of patients in this scenario, a vulnerable scenario, uh, I think there are two main things that we as providers owe them. And one is to be available and to be uh, available, not just personally with our time, but also with our emotions. And I'm a big believer in that taking care of patients is more than just providing medicines or doing surgery. You know, there's a connection there. And then the other is being honest. And I felt like, um, when I went through my own experience, that's what I wanted. I didn't want it sugar-coated. I didn't want it to be, oh, you're going to be fine. I wanted to hear the truth. And that doesn't give us license as providers to be cruel with that honesty, right? Uh, not like shock and awe, but, but it's just that when something comes up, we're going to be honest. And that also includes when we don't know the answer. I tell patients that right up front, there's going to be questions you have that I don't know the answer to. I'll go try to find them out, but also there's the things we just don't know. And it's important that people know that um, from the beginning. And then, you know, I think that issue about honesty when it comes to prognosis is another one that I personally struggled with, you know, thinking about for myself, you're dealing with a condition where, okay, your cure rate, let's say it's 90%. Well, that's, that's great. If you have a hundred people and you can, you know, look at that, but for every individual person, every outcome is 50 50. Mm -hmm. So even if your cure rates 99%, let's say a stage one seminoma, that's great. You feel good. You had a 99%, you know, chance of cure, but for that one person out of the hundred that, that died from that disease, that didn't, that didn't mean anything. It didn't make them feel any better. So uh, it's important that people are heard and their concerns and their anxieties are, are validated because I think there can be times where as providers, we hear 
a new diagnosis, stage one seminoma, that person's likely going to do great. And maybe we won't give them the, the attention that they need because it's still a life-threatening condition, right? It may be less likely that they will die from it, but it's not zero. And uh, your emotions don't have you know, a gradation that way. It's just like, oh my gosh, I have this life-threatening illness. So anyway, I took that and ran with it. I'm sorry, Stephen, I probably talked more than you wanted to focus on that. It just, it brought up a lot of things personally for me that then I utilize in my own, uh, you know, patient care. Yeah, no, that was a great answer. And, and, and thank you for taking the negative in your life and making it into a positive. And you mentioned empathy. I mean, that's something that I haven't been to medical school, but I presume that's not something they can teach in a class. Right. I mean, they talk about it and they test it. So that can tell you about how well they teach it. Right. (laughs) Um, yeah, I mean, I think ultimately, um, almost every scenario in life, if you could, when you're dealing with that interaction, if you could put yourself in the other person's shoes and try to feel what they're feeling, it would, um, it would take care of almost every problem that we have. Um, I just think people don't do that often enough. And again, the hustle and bustle of a medical, um, you know, kind of work day, it's hard to squeeze that in. I get it. But, uh, ultimately that's what we should be doing, I think. And, um, you just got to kind of try to find a way to, to connect with your patients in that manner. Well, shout out to you. Um, All right, so let's get into it. So the first topic we have is fertility preservation, which anybody who maybe has just been diagnosed, maybe they have or have not talked about sperm making. I mean, that's something that's really important. Yeah, I mean, I think there are, there's just a ton of data out there um, about how important this is to patients. And as a surgeon, you know, we may not, feel that because, you know, they, a patient comes in and at that m- moment, it's not front of their mind. You know, they've just been told that they likely have cancer. They want to rush to the operating room. They want to start that process of being cured, but it's our responsibility to think about it over a long period of time and recognize that the greatest regret that patients have. So if you look at cancer survivors, childhood cancer survivors, young adult cancer survivors, their number one regret is fertility preservation, that it wasn't brought up or that they didn't elect to do it. Actually, what's even more interesting is it's not always that they regret they didn't do it. It's often that they regret they didn't hear about it. So some people will decide not to. That's totally fine. It's not our job to make them do it. It's our job to make them understand why it's important to consider, and then they can make the decision what they want to do. But a lot of the regret is around they just didn't hear about it. And then, you know, they're 10 years later after their diagnosis and they're cured and now they can't have kids and and that's or at least not in the way they maybe imagined and with a very straightforward consultation and and um you know relatively inexpensive and, and that can be covered by a lot of mechanisms uh, we can I, I call it an insurance policy right you know it's likely that guys with testis cancer will not suffer long-term effects or infertility either because they won't have chemotherapy or the chemotherapy they get won't cause a long-term infertility, uh, but you don't know who that's going to be. Mm-hmm. And you have an opportunity at that time to get it done and uh, kind of pay that insurance policy and, and then be uh, guaranteed that later in life, you would be able to you know, have a family um, if that's what you want. Uh, it sounds like from talking to other survivors, I mean, it seems like when people are diagnosed, there's not a lot of um, turnaround, but or there, I guess it's a quick turnaround between when they're diagnosed and their orchiectomy. Is there any, like, I did my sperm making after my orchiectomy. Would there be any benefit to doing it before your orchiectomy, if you have time? Yeah, there's some data around that. Um, there's some guys that um, actually end up producing a better sperm sample post-orchiectomy because some of the hormones that are made by the tumor can, can decrease the fertility potential of even the other testicle. My take on it is that um, you never know what's going to end up happening after the surgery. And you may start down a road that then that timeline gets compressed. So let's say you don't do staging imaging before the orchiectomy. You don't do sperm banking. They have the orchiectomy. Then they get staging imaging. Then there's a rush to start chemotherapy. And then it gets lost. And in my mind, it it takes a day. And and it's very rare with testis cancer that orchiectomy needs to happen. 
the day you've seen them or the next day. And we sometimes do that because lots of logistics, but it's rarely necessary. And again, I think that this is where we need to be driving the patient care based on what the patient wants. And so I, I, I think it's important to talk about it with them at that time and say, would you like to do this? If so, we can get it arranged. And there's a lot of, again, the word logistics, but there's a lot of uh, workflows that have to be built in to be able to accommodate this. And sometimes that's hard for maybe a urologist that doesn't deal with testis cancer or cancer a lot. As you may know, a lot of orchiectomies get done by urologists that aren't necessarily focused in cancer care. And so they're, you know, maybe not thinking about these issues on a day-to-day basis, like some other more special specialized uh, urologist would be. And uh, so they may not be tied into the kind of workflow that you need to get them to uh, someplace to do sperm banking or uh, a fertility counselor to talk about that. Um, if we're, I'm very fortunate that we've got a dedicated fertility preservation team. And so even on weekends, they'll, they'll help with that. Um, but but kind of like a testicular prosthesis, it shouldn't be our decision whether it gets offered or not. We should offer it to everybody. Mm-hmm. and and talk about pros, cons, how does it, you know, affect the surgery timing and so forth, and then let the patient decide. Uh, um, something that we haven't really talked about on this podcast um, is everybody knows that, you know, it requires a sperm and an egg to, to make a person, but can you talk about, and this maybe isn't exactly related to testicular cancer other than the testicle, but I mean, what is like the journey of, of sperm like creation and and how does that all play into this? Yeah, so that's uh, the and and this gets into a little bit about testis cancer itself actually in a roundabout way and the way I explain it to patients is that you know the testicle has two main functions one's to make sperm and one is to make hormones and the cells that go on to make sperm are germ cells and you know over ninety five percent of the time when you have a tumor in your testicle it's from those cells and in my mind. The way I think about it is that that's relatively common because those cells are rapidly dividing all the time to make more pre-sperm cells. And so it's kind of any time in the body something is frequently turning over or dividing, it's at risk for becoming a malignancy. And then the other cells, the ones that make the hormones, are kind of nursing and supporting those germ cells. Those don't divide that rapidly, and so it's less likely that they're going to become a malignancy. Though we, you know, can see a strong, what are called stromal tumors. But uh, essentially, the testicle, then, you know, as you're starting puberty as a kid, these cells start this process, these germ cells of becoming sperm. And what happens is they go through a few different stages of what are called spermatogonia. And then they work themselves through these tubules within the testicle, and then they go into the epididymis, which is a structure that sits next to the testicle, and they mature over a period of months, um, 90 days or so. And then they come through the epididymis, uh, from the epididymis through the vas deferens into the seminiferous, uh, excuse me, into the vas, the, uh, uh, totally blanking on the name, and basically into near the prostate and then uh, out when they're ejaculated out, out that way. And so, um, you know, the, when you sperm bank, you're getting the mature sperm that's contrasted to, um, when you have like a surgical procedure to harvest sperm from the testicle itself, they may be at relatively less mature, uh, stages. And so that's why sometimes those kind of uh, sperm cells aren't quite as effective when then they go to try to use them. So the gold standard for fertility, you know, future fertility would be um, using the mature sperm that are ejaculated and then freezing them. The seminal vesicle, sorry, that was the term I was trying to come up with that sit behind the prostate. That's where the um, sperm from the vas deferens go in at that point and then mix with seminal fluid that comes out when you ejaculate. I probably should have known that, but I didn't. Uh, thank you no, for that. Um, you mentioned the epididymis, which I think is another common thing with um, testicular cancer patients is maybe their primary. Um, and in, in my case, this is the what happened. The primary are initially diagnosed as epididymitis. So does that, um, how does that kind of play into testicular cancer? 
Yeah, so the the epididymis, that structure where the sperm mature that sit along the side of the testicle, causes a couple of different problems when we're thinking about testis cancer. One is that if you deal with maybe a PCP that's not comfortable with doing the genital exam, they feel the structure that's not the testicle and it feels different and they could mistake it for a tumor. It's not uncommon that somebody will come in and say, oh, there's this thing I felt in the scrotum and it's just the epididymis or it's a cyst on the epididymis. So it's really important to understand that kind of anatomic difference. And then epididymitis is generally when you get a, an infection in the testicle, it's kind of, it, it flows, what we'd say retrograde, meaning it comes back from the urine. So the urine system ties into this genital system through that area in the prostate with the seminal vesicles and the vas deferens. And so an infection in there can, can work itself back through the vas deferens into the epididymis. So that's usually the first place where it flares up. And so uh, when someone has swelling in the testicle, the concern, you know, is that, well, it's an infection in that area. And so people will not uncommonly first go to, well, let's just treat it. Uh, it's an important thing to realize that if, if a guy has epididymitis, I, I always image those patients with an ultrasound. It's easy to do. It's easy to get. It's cheap. And it can tell you pretty definitively if there's a mass there or not, or if it's just infection. But if you don't, if you treat somebody and it doesn't get better and there's still a mass there, then you need to look into that deeper. It should never be you treat epididymitis and you just don't get follow-up because about 10 to 15% of guys with testis cancer are initially actually diagnosed with epididymitis. And it was never epididymitis. It's just that that's what somebody thought it was. And, and there's sad scenarios where they just give them a 10 day course of antibiotics and they tell them, you know, call me back if things don't get better. But the reality is, is that, you know, young guys aren't good about being plugged into the health system. And in this case, they tried to get into the health system and maybe they got kind of blown off. So then they wait longer to come back until then it's even worse. So that's an education piece for both the providers and for the patients that, you should never just, you know, have epididymitis that's treated and not followed up. And similarly, if you're a patient, don't just stop at that point, you know, make sure you get the follow-up to make sure it's not something else. Interesting. Yeah. My primary said epididymitis, she, di- she prescribed the antibiotics and then, um, but she did order the ultrasound. So she had that wherewithal. Um, jumping back to the sperm banking, um, why is it, not a good idea to do it after chemo starts and what kind of effect does chemo have on the sperm? Yeah, it's a great, great question. So, um, chemotherapy works by disrupting the growth and division of cells while they try, you know, they're relatively, you know, wanted to be targeted. That's why certain chemotherapies work for certain cancers as opposed to others. But in general, they're not very specific. And so any cell in your body that rapidly divides is going to be affected. That's why you lose your hair because your hair cells are dividing. That's why you can slough some of your intestinal lining and get the diarrhea and the nausea because it, those cells rapidly divide. Um, that's why it can affect things like your fingernails and so forth. Anyway, Similarly, one of the areas in your body that are rapidly dividing cells are these germ cells. So they're extremely sensitive to chemotherapy, regardless of what kind of cancer you have, what you're being treated for. But in testis cancer specifically, it's the same reason why it kills the testis cancer cells. It kills the the uh, pre-sperm cells, those germ cells. So it, it really damages those cells and their ability to divide and grow. And so, um, essentially once you've gotten it, any of those sperm that, you know, are in the process are going to be wiped out or so affected that you wouldn't want to use those cells to have a kid uh, because of potential risks there with, with, you know, uh, birth anomalies. Um, Fortunately, about 80 to 85% of guys after traditional chemotherapy for testis cancer, BEP, will recover normal sperm function after about two years. But you don't know, right? You don't know if you're part of that 85% or part of that 15%. And and, um, once you started chemotherapy, that process has happened. So it's a little different than in women where sometimes even after they've gotten chemotherapy, they can harvest an egg or even a whole ovary because the way that ovarian 
uh, follicles develop is different. They're kind of already ready when a, when a woman hits post puberty, all the eggs she's ever going to have are developed. So the chemotherapy doesn't affect it because it's not dividing that same way. So it's a difference between men and women in that sense. Um, but uh, your question earlier about the timing of it, I generally, I have guys do it before orchiectomy. The la andrology lab will say, we got a ton of great sperm, no worries. Or they'll say, we got some or maybe even none. Let's try again after orchiectomy. So we try again. But, you know. Interesting. If some is good, more is better, in my opinion, right? Yeah, I did a uh, another seam analysis this year, about two and a half years out. And my urologist said that it... Um, it looked okay. It looked mostly okay. There were some that were like, I don't remember the, the terminology used. I, I'll just say misshapen, I guess, but. Sure. Um, yeah. Morphology. They look at the shape. They look at the mobility, the motility of them. And they look at the number. And um, some of that has to do with then how they can use the sample. If they don't, if they're not really modal, they don't swim well. They, they would only really use that for what we'd say I, IVF or literally putting the sperm cell with an egg as opposed to you can do inter intrauterine insemination where you would just take a, a conglomerate of, of a number of sperm and you could then inseminate basically redoing the same ana you know, anatomy that would happen. It gets uh, pushed into the new uterus and, and then the, would meet naturally. And that's relatively less expensive than uh, IVF, which is more expensive. Hmm. All right. Um, I had a question that I forgot. Let's see. Yeah, the one thing uh, before we leave that, that I would bring up that can be difficult is, is that there's a thought that the reason why guys develop testis cancer is because that testicle or maybe both testicles didn't form. I hate to use the word normally, but in a, in a fully normal way. So there's slightly what we would say dysgenic it's thought to be the reason why undescended testicles are predisposed to getting testis cancer. So it may be that the other testicle in a case where you, you do a sperm analysis afterwards and it's showing some anomalies. Uh, it may not be that it was because you had testis cancer chemotherapy or anything. It may just be that that testicle was also just not quite, you know, it, it didn't form in the same way. And, uh, so it may be at risk for not producing sperm that were that having been said, there's not a direct correlation between a semen analysis and what happens. I mean, if there are no sperm, then yeah, you, you're not going to have a make a, you know, be able to have a kid, but if but the morphology and motility, there's still lots of times that guys then spontaneously have kids, you know, and they've been making sperm like that their whole life. So uh, it's a, it's a rough sketch of what things look like, but it's not a, it doesn't mean that that, you know, guy will be able or not be able to have a child spontaneous. Interesting. All right. My other question that I was thinking of that I forgot that I now remember is um, you work at a children's hospital. Does it, and testicular cancer, I guess, kind of skews younger. Is that because maybe when guys are younger, their body's producing more sperm and that's where the sure. cells are rapidly dividing? Yeah. It's a great question. So and I actually, I split my time between the children's hospital and the adult hospital. So I have a practice in both areas. Um, but it's an interesting type of cancer, testis cancer in that, yeah, it, it really, it can happen to men of any age. And, and, you know, we'll even see testicular germ cell tumors in kids in the first year of life. It's a slightly different, but most commonly it, there's something about puberty that kicks it off. And so then between like 13 and, you know, 40, it's the most common type of solid tumor we see in men. And, um, I, I, the, the thought is, is that they are relatively what we call embryonic tumors. So there are different kinds of cancers, you know, in different organs, but there are also different kinds of cells that become cancers. And when kids have cancer and young adults have cancer, most typically they're what we call embryonic kind of malignancies, meaning they're normal cells that during the process of development went haywire, as opposed to when we think about things like that are more carcinomas, those are generally cells that 
because of mutations caused by outside forces then mutated into cancer cells. So testis cancer uh, is generally thought to be more of like an embryologic type malignancy, meaning those cells were at some point, you know, trying to develop normally and they just went a little haywire. And it's not because they've accumulated hundreds and thousands of mutations, like say a lung cancer would because of smoking or colon cancer would because of a variety of other things. Um, it's, and that's why we don't see in general an individual patient's environmental exposure, we don't think, cause testis cancer the way that, say, smoking would lead to kidney cancer, bladder cancer, lung cancer. And uh, so those kinds of what we say embryonic and embryologic malignancies like testis cancer, like uh, things that we see in kids such as Wilms tumor, what are called nephroblastomas or uh, neuroblastoma. Those, those tend to happen just in younger patients because it doesn't require like a lifelong of exposure to toxins to cause it like you would expect for adult type malignancies. Okay. Um, I definitely want to get to these other topics, but this is, oh, yeah. this is really interesting. Um, I know fertility preservation, whether, were, were there other avenues other than sperm making? I know with the RPL and D there's, uh, sure. Yep. So RPL and D is an interesting one, right? Because there's nothing that's done that's toxic to the sperm themselves this, in the surgery standpoint, but the potential damage to the nerves that control ejaculation may make it such that they don't ejaculate it out. In that case, fertility preservation can include doing a uh, post-orgasmic uh, urine sample. So essentially what happens is they get retrograde flow of the ejaculate with the sperm back into the bladder as opposed to coming out. And so then, then if you were at a, say a, a fertility clinic uh, after masturbation, if nothing came out, they would then have you void or pee, I should say, they would collect that pee and then they could clean it and, and get the sperm out of that. Um, and because it's not that the RPL and D caused any damage to the sperm, it just kind of damaged the mechanism of it getting out. And then they can use that, uh, those sperm, with the intrauterine insemination, because usually there's the same number of sperm as you would have in a normal ejaculate. It's just, you got to kind of get it out, clean it, and then you can do the intrauterine in insemination. And that is again, relatively cheaper than IVF because there's no real storage cost, right? You, you ejaculate it, it's clean. They, then the next day or two, they use it to do the intrauterine insemination as opposed to the IVF where if you sperm bank and they freeze it, then they have to store it until you're ready to use it and then process it, you know, draw out the individual sperm they're going to use and put it into the eggs. So it's just more labor intensive, but uh, yeah, it is another avenue of fertility preservation. And then the last one is, you know, kind of what we'd say surgical, you know, interventions. And this is where we're starting to do this more in like kids, even before puberty, where we do surgery and excise some of the testicular tissue to look for sperm or um, maybe even some of those pre-sperm cells that maybe in the future we can find a way to mature them in the lab and use them. And so um, there are a number of centers and we're one of them now that for kids with cancer, um, we will do testicular biopsies for tissue cryopreservation, preservation so that hopefully when they get older, you know, we know that their chemotherapy uh, may damage their ability to have kids and so if we have that banked, you know, maybe we'll find a way to use that in a, in a way that can, you know, help them have kids. Uh, and there's some interesting ethics around that. Um, but uh, th that's another thing that we do. And sometimes we even do that for men after puberty, but we just have no other way of getting the sperm uh, effectively. So we'll do this kind of testicular extraction surgery um, to, to get tissue. That's amazing. I've only ever heard of the retrograde ejaculation kind of as a, um, I don't, this is probably the wrong term to use, but like a death sentence for, for, uh, fertility. So no. that's no, not at all. So then you'd have the option of either the collecting it and the voided in the urine, uh, when you void after, after having an ejaculate, after having an orgasm or having a, a surgical, you know, relatively minor surgical procedure to harvest uh, the sperm from the, the remaining testicle that's, um, you know, either for whatever reasons, just not coming out or, or whatnot. So 
yeah, I mean, there, there are lots of options. Again, that's where patients need to understand that when they have somebody that's like, oh, no, it's not possible, that they don't just take that at face value, that they maybe dig a little deeper to find out what options are out there. Wow. I mean, when you, I don't know if it's true or not because I'm not a doctor, but you hear about, you know, back in the day, doctors used to drill into people's heads literally. And then, you know, how far science and medicine have come. That's just amazing. Well, I mean, again, we'll look back on this conversation probably in 50 years and think how barbaric it was that we did that because they'll have been able to use, you know, I mean, there's technologies now where people are talking about, you know, using a patient's cells from anywhere in their body and you could kind of make it into a sperm. Um, so it may not be necessary that you have to get that from the testicle, you know, to be able to then, you know, have it, you know, who knows? I mean, again, we're the things that we have now, as opposed to what we did even 20 years ago, or, you know, it's just amazing. So yeah, might, might not even be careful people. about what we think we know, because, you know, it's, it's all time sensitive. We might not even need people anymore soon. Uh, I don't <laughs> know about that. All right. So the second topic um, is gonadal function impact of TC therapy, which I guess we kind of touched on with um, talking about sperm making after chemo, but where else can that topic take us? Well, it, it gets back to what we talked about before the second function of the testicle besides making sperm is the making hormones. And this is a fear that a lot of guys have. You're taking out one of my testicles. What about testosterone? Fortunately, it's only about 5% of guys after an orchiectomy that will have low testosterone that affects them in any way, or what we would say hypogonadism. Um, but it's not zero. But it, so, you know, we have to validate again that concern that, that guys have. And the problem in this area is that there's not a direct correlation between the testosterone value you might get if you do a serum test for it and what someone's symptoms are. And so there's been a long conflict between guys coming in and complaining of symptoms of low testosterone. And then say they get their labs and the, the levels are look normal. Um, similarly, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what the symptoms are of low testosterone. So guys think it means, oh, they don't, they don't have erections or they're not putting on muscle mass like they would want. But really, the symptoms of low testosterone have much more to do with kind of emotional things like a lack of interest in what you would have normally been doing, uh, a lack of uh, desire to, to, to do physical activity. It's really not the, what you see on TV about sex drive or erections. And so sometimes when guys come in after a rachiectomy, they complain of these things. And it's because they've been seeing, you know, the, the ad campaigns on TV are just really an, you know, not doing justice to it. They're trying to set up these false expectations. So, but because of that, providers often don't listen to the guys when they're talking about it. So I actually am doing some research and I'm interested in the idea that uh, it probably has a lot more to do with what your testosterone level was before you ever started down this treatment pathway and then how, what it got to afterwards as opposed to just a, a level after you're all done. So what I mean by that is let's say that the normal level is 300 and above. If you, you know, started at a level of a thousand and you had an orchiectomy and it, it, it went down to 500, that may not be considered, you know, abnormal by the way the lab test is, but you would probably feel pretty crappy. Mm -hmm. If you started at 350 and it went down to 290, now it may say that it's low, but you may not feel any different. So I think it's the, my hypothesis is it's the difference in those two that matters, not the absolute value at the end. The problem is we don't routinely check it beforehand. And then there's a lot of confounding things about it at the beginning where we know, for example, depression can cause your testosterone to be low. The stress of a new diagnosis can cause your testosterone to be low. Some of the hormones that uh, testis cancer make may cause your testosterone to be low. So even if we're checking it routinely, as I do before orchiectomy, that may not be a real value either. So that's, as we try to study this issue, um, we understand there, there are caveats to it, but uh, we, I think we need to do better. And I, I do foresee a time where we would be routinely checking testosterone at the beginning and then 
we would also be developing and using better survey instruments about how guys feel so rather than come in and say oh well i'm you know like i can't uh, you know i don't look like arnold schwarzenegger i must need testosterone you know there's got to be a better way to objectively look at that with surveys of guys symptoms that um validate their concerns that they have but also drill down onto the questions that are really correlated with testosterone levels because the problem is is that if you get someone who doesn't need testosterone and you put them on testosterone guys may not know this but once you start taking what we'd say exogenous testosterone that wipes out your that remaining testicles ability to make sperm so it'll just stop wow so you know, you're dealing with a 25 year old guy. He wants high testosterone. He says, mine must be low. Cause I had a rachectomy. He finds somebody that puts him on testosterone and then it may not help him that much because his testosterone wasn't that low to begin with, but now he's infertile and that may not resolve. Interestingly, they've looked at testosterone as a male type of birth control. Um, so it can tell you what it does to the sperm production. So, and I, I see that not uncommonly just had a guy in clinic last week, same that scenario. I just laid out 25 year old guy. He found somebody giving testosterone. He's now coming to us for his testis cancer follow-up. And he says he wants to have kids and never sperm banked. And he's, he has no sperm. Mm. It's ejaculate. And, you know, he, he went down that pathway because he wanted to bulk up a little bit and found somebody that would, you know, one of these kind of predatory men's health clinics it was a really sad situation. So, um, I, I try to talk about all these issues with our new, newly diagnosed patients. So they understand what they're getting into that these things that they do to their body and we do to their body sometimes, uh, have real implications long-term. Yeah, that's important. This question might sound facetious, but it's more genuine and, and just amazement. I mean, when you have these caveats that you mentioned, how do you confidently, make assessments on a patient given that there's so many factors at play? Sure. So I think, you know, some of it has to do with what or are you talking about around the testosterone level? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that we, and we don't, this isn't just like a one-time assessment, right? These are things we talk to the patients about repeatedly about how are they feeling and what drives us to then refer them to, we have in our, our, our clinic and our cancer center, uh, a men's health guy that does all of our replacement hormone replacement. And what guides me about referral for that generally is symptoms and not testosterone levels. We get them, we look at them, but again, if a guy's levels are normal, but they have these symptoms, then sometimes we say, Hey, maybe we should still supplement you. In that case, we generally will have them do sperm banking beforehand before starting it, just in case they do have long-term, you know, problems with making sperm because of the testosterone. Um, And then similarly, you know, we have some guys that have symptoms and generally the first thing we'll do is we have a great lifestyle uh, clinic. And what's interesting is you put a guy on a better diet and have him start exercising, they'll feel better and their testosterones go up. That's what I. So we try a lot of those things before we go straight to testosterone replacement with the obvious exception of the guys that have bilateral orchiectomies. Unfortunately, I mean, that's just have to replace that so yeah you mentioned that um at the time of recording this you haven't heard the previous episode because none of them are out yet but uh, mm-hmm. a previous guest um will flannery will flannery dr glockham fucking on uh social media who's pretty big time uh he's an ophthalmologist yeah. though and i feel like famous just by being adjacent to him so yeah you're coming out awesome. shortly after him um but mm-hmm. he had he was a two-time survivor so he has um no testicles. And he was talking about, um, insurance being an issue with testosterone, um, the different kinds, like he had to give give himself like a shot or a gel and he couldn't be around his daughters or whatever, because they could get it. But now he's got some new thing that he's, that he talked about with like these beads. Yep. So you can do an implant under the skin. And that's again, where you have to understand and I'd say this all the time, right? There are a lot of things in medicine that you don't want to come to me about because I don't know about them, but there, there are these narrow areas that I spend a lot of time in. And, and so when you go to a doctor and you need to be very, it's, it's, 
acceptable to say, you know, how often do you deal, deal with this? And do you, you know, how well do you know this issue? And, and you know, I'm, I'm never offended if somebody wants to go, you know, see someone else or get a second opinion uh, and we encourage it. And again, this is one of those where, you know, you may be dealing with somebody, the only thing they know about is, yeah, the injection or the, or the, the gel and they don't know about, you know, the implant. And so um, I would just challenge guys to take responsibility for their own health and potentially seek out people that could, you know, be of help or maybe tell them about something new that's out there. Off topic a little bit, but I mentioned he talked about the insurance issues with testosterone as a provider and uh, testicular cancer is one of the more rare ones. How do you deal with insurance kind of pushing back on things? Yeah, the, The guy that I mentioned, John Dodge, that does our men's health in our cancer center, in our clinic, in our urologic oncology clinic, we have like a form letter and we send it out and it, I, I mean, you know, he starts to see them for that. So I, I can't say that it always works, but I don't hear about it being a problem. So, you know, we have that kind of the system figured out about what we need to say and uh, that generally takes care of it. Awesome. All right. This third topic as we come down the home stretch is testicle spraying surgery. Yeah. What is that all about? Yeah. So this is something that I got interested in when I was an oncology fellow. Um, we had a guy that had a mass relatively small, about a centimeter and a half, and um, did an orchiectomy because that's the general teaching. If a guy has a solid testicular mass with blood flow and ultrasound, then they should get an orchiectomy because, you know, it's considered to almost always be malignancy and that the treatment for germ cell tumors is, is radical orchiectomy. But this guy, it turned out to not be a germ cell tumor. It was a what's called a testicular lighting cell tumor. So it's one of those stromal tumors where it's from the cells that would actually make testosterone. And so what's interesting with those is that generally then just removing the tumor is sufficient treatment because uh, the, it kind of developed a tumor on its own solitarily. It's not that the rest of the cells in that testicle are at risk of cancer, as opposed to germ cell tumors where, as I mentioned before, it's generally thought that the reason he had a, a tumor there is because that testicle didn't develop quite as it should have. And so it's not just that one tumor that you see, but that all those cells in that tumor are slightly at increased risk. And we know, for example, if you just did a partial orchiectomy or testis sparing surgery uh, for a germ cell tumor, the rate of it coming back in that testicle is about 10% per year. So that at five years, it's 50%. So that's why we don't just take out the tumor if it's a germ cell tumor, because it's going to come back. Mm-hmm. So, but not all are germ cell tumors. And um, if you think about the math, you know, how many times do you have to take out the whole testicle and be wrong before it's a problem? And how could you do better with that from the beginning? And so um, we've done some research looking at uh, this and there's a number of centers, there's a group in Italy that have looked at it. That generally, if you have a lesion in the testicle that's less than two centimeters, that definitely starts to decrease the chance that it's a germ cell tumor. If they don't have elevated tumor markers, meaning HCG or AFP, before the surgery, before the orchiectomy, and it's a lesion less than two centimeters, that number may be then as high as 50% of the time it's not a germ cell tumor. So we have, uh, we're working on developing a clinical trial with uh, Dr. Pirazio, another TCAF guy, and uh, Dr. Carey and Dr. Magrodia, uh, looking at a trial of guys in that scenario where they have a lesion less than two centimeters normal serum tumor markers, Uh, rather than take out the whole testicle, we would do a surgery where we take out the tumor, we'd have a frozen section done intraoperatively for the pathologist to look at what it is. And if it's not a germ cell tumor, then put the rest of the testicle back in so that it can make hormones and sperm as it had been. Um, But if it's a germ cell tumor and they can tell us that, then we can take out the whole testicle there and no harm other than maybe 30 extra minutes waiting for the pathologist to tell us what it was. And I've been doing this in my practice now for nine years and uh, can't think of a time. I know, I know cause I've looked at, I've not had a guy in over 60 of these types of surgeries that has delayed. I mean, later on been, Oh wait, it actually was a germ cell tumor. Once the pathologist looked at it more. Wow. And it's about 50, 50, about 50% of the time it's not a germ cell tumor. And so the partial orchiectomy or the other term for that test is sparing surgery is sufficient treatment. And so 
it just enables you to avoid taking out the whole testicle in guys that, that don't need that done. And for all the same reasons we've talked about before, the psychological impact of missing a whole testicle, you know, because actually when you put that remaining part of the testicle back in the scrotum, even if you've taken out up to half of the testicle, you can't really tell the difference from the outside. It's amazing. Hmm. Um, and then it still makes, you know, the hormones. And so there's a lot of potential benefits. Um, and I think probably the most exciting part about it is, and what we're trying to really include in this clinical trial is the work that Dr. Bagrodi is doing with microRNA 371, where if your microRNA 371 is not elevated and you have a testis mass, it's probably not a germ cell tumor. And so we can use that to decide whether we need to do radical or partial orchiectomy. Wow. Because just because it's not a germ cell tumor doesn't mean it's not something that still needs to get treated. It's just that you, you may not need to remove the whole testicle for it. And, and again, intraoperatively, you can use the frozen section from your pathologist to, to guide that decision in, in real time. Hmm. So, okay. So when you have, you said it's hard to tell after when there's a partial testicle in there that anything has been done is that is the uh, psychosocial benefit, like the strongest one, or is there, does the no, sperm well, production I don't still? know. Cause, cause we've not, we've not studied it prospectively. Okay. My anecdotal sense is that it, that's part of it. Okay. If we do this clinical trial, we can get it off the ground. We will include measurements of guys sense of things for sure. We'll also look at things like hormones. We'll look at um, uh, bone health. So one of the things too, when you decrease your testosterone, it affects your bone health. So, you know, we would make an argument that by just removing the tumor and leaving the rest of the testicle to do its hormonal function, we're going to make guys healthier for that reason too. But um, yeah, I think it's some of all of those things. I can't say it's just one thing. Um, and again, it's important that I, I'm very clear. This is not saying that just removing the tumor is the right thing to do in a germ cell tumor. This is for the, the small population of guys that present with a smaller lesion generally and don't have elevated tumor markers. Uh, those are guys that were kind of then drilled down on a group that probably aren't as likely to have had a germ cell tumor. And so rather than expose, you know, it's, it's kind of like you don't, you don't treat every infection the same, yeah. right? You use what's right for that kind of infection. In this case, you want to use the right kind of surgery for that kind of cancer. And uh, while most of the time a cancer in the testicle is a germ cell tumor, and most of the time it requires a radical orchiectomy, it's not 100%. And, we, we, you know, percentages, as I, the first thing we talked about today, percentages apply to a group of 100 people. They don't apply to an individual person. So you can tell the guy all you want, oh, 99%, I'm sure it's this, we're going to do this kind of surgery. Even if he's just that 1% ends up his whole testicle removed, you know, yeah, he's going to live. But if he didn't need that done, he's going to kind of be like, why did you do this? Can't, isn't there a better way? And that's what we're trying to get to is I think there's a better way for some of these guys. Yeah, that's going to be awesome to see the results of the, the study. And you said you felt famous adjacent by being after uh, Dr. Glockenfleck. And I feel a superhero adjacent after having everybody you just mentioned has been on this podcast, all those doctors. So all you guys, well, we all go back, you know, uh, I think relatively, I, I can't, I won't, you know, say anybody's ages, but Phil and Clint and I are all relatively around the same, you know, age and training. And then Aditya was one of the resident, he was a medical student when I was a resident in Dallas. And then he was, a when I was the oncology fellow, I think he was like a second year resident. So he's, despite his balding, um, he's not quite as old as everybody else. Uh, uh, but he's probably the biggest star of all four of us. So, um, yeah, the four, and you know, a lot of the people that are involved in the testis cancer community, it's a small community and are very close. And, uh, I I'm extremely fortunate to count all those guys as, uh, friends, um, for, first and foremost, and then colleagues, uh, second as well. Yeah, and I'm thankful to have all you guys on the podcast. Uh, I have one last question. Uh, the with that testicular sparing surgery, um, I believe, and I didn't see my testicle when it came out, but so I don't know for sure. But I believe my tumor was on the inside. So how? What's like the most common thing? Is it attached to the outside? Is it on the inside of the testicle? So for a germ cell tumor, they will all be within the testicle in the sense that the testicle, the, the cells that where a germ cell tumor comes from 
are within what are called the seminiferous tubules. And then that's fully encased by what's called the tunica albuginea. So imagine the tunica albuginea like a duffel bag and the seminiferous tubules where the germ cells are like, you know, when you're packing for a trip and you just stuff, (laughs) they're just literally jammed in this tight kind of um, relatively uh, capacious lining, this tunica albuginea that, that holds it all. And so the tumors are almost always confined within that. Sometimes they will erode into the tunica, very rarely out of it. But these smaller lesions are almost there within that. And so when you do this testis sparing surgery, you know, we will use an intraoperative ultrasound. So I'll use an ultrasound, ultrasound on the testicle directly after it's been kind of delivered out of that inguinal incision. We drape out the patient so that the testis doesn't touch the skin or anything. It's lying on a, on a drape. We then use an ultrasound to identify exactly where in the testicle that tumor is. And we incise that lining, that tunic albuginia, and then, and then excise the tumor and the surround a few, you know, a kind of an envelope of surrounding normal seminiferous tubules to make sure that we're getting all the cancer, all the tumor. And then we close that tunica back up and uh, wait for the pathologist. And then if they say it looks good, we close kind of the, the few other layers that overlie that. We, and then we dunk the testicle back into the scrotum through that inguinal incision and uh, call it a day. Or if they say it's a germ cell tumor, you need to remove the whole thing. It's, it's literally only hanging at that point by the vas deferens in the blood supply. So we can just tie those things and then we're done. So once we get back from the pathologist, it's about five minutes and then we're done either way. So it's not like a, I mean, I wish I could tell you it was like brain surgery or since you had Dr. <laughs> you know, I'm going to butcher his name, but as an ophthalmologist, not even like eye surgery, it's, <laughs> we're just urologists. So it's pretty basic. Well, I don't think there's a word beyond amazing that I can think of, but if there was a word, then I would use it to say that you guys are doing incredible, amazing, fantastic work. Is there anything you want to add? I know you got to run. No, I, I, I'm extremely honored to be here. I love the work that I get to do with the TCA app and with the testic, testicular cancer society as well. You know, this is an area that I'm very devoted to and just, you know, personally, because of my own experiences, I feel a great responsibility to be involved as an advocate for patients and um, the work that uh, you all do is, is outstanding. So thanks for, the chance to chat and you know again i could i feel like sometimes when we do these kinds of things i could go on all day so thanks for listening to me. no it was great yeah thank you so much dr nick cost for being on it takes balls for more information and resources for your testicular cancer journey visit testicular cancer awareness foundation.org you can also follow us on social media at testis cancer we're on facebook at testicular cancer awareness foundation